Colossians chapter 3, let's begin where we, uh, let's begin at the text we looked at last time, which was verse 15. Morning. Colossians 3 and verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank You for Your Word. We don't ever want to take it for granted. Thank You for giving us a place to worship. We thank You for the freedom to do so. Lord, we thank You for Your Spirit, which is our trust and our hope this morning that You would meet with us by Your Spirit and You would make Your Word, Lord, to be declared and received effectually and Lord, we would be helped and transformed by it. I think about my brother Tim up there in Maine. We pray You'd remember him today and meet with those brethren as well. We have brethren down in Reynosa, Lord, and Lord, Your blessings would be upon that conference for the good of that church. Lord, thank You for Your goodness to us. We pray You would bless Your Word abundantly in our midst today. In Jesus' name and for His sake, Amen. And so last time we we looked at verse 15, uh, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And we talked about the different kinds of, of peace that the world pursues. Uh, and seeks to provide. And we talked about uh, how that differs from biblical peace. And how biblical peace is presented to us really in two different aspects. Uh, we talked about there being a, a, a positional, objective state of peace granted to us when we're justified by faith. And then secondly, this, this heartfelt peace that, that Paul is really expressing here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And I sought to emphasize the command to let Christ rule, reminding us of the fundamental reality and claim of the Gospel for Jesus Christ to take the throne of our lives, our hearts. And that that's not, that's not an optional element to Christianity, as some would like to make it. And then we, we briefly looked at Paul tying this peace of Christ to these brethren here in Colossae being called together in one body, he says. Meaning the local body of Jesus Christ, His church. Paul expressing concern for the, for the unity and the peace within the church. And really that Christ's peace ruling in our hearts serves as a prerequisite to peace being maintained in the body of Christ. But Paul continues on. He keeps developing this, this stream of very practical, essential Christian imperatives of these put-ons and, and these two let statements here by adding the second one, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's, there's no conjunction between verses 15 and 16, but Paul is obviously making a connective parallel statement here. Let the peace of Christ rule and let the Word of Christ dwell. Peace, rule, Word, dwell. Christ being the common denominator. The Texas Receptus, which is our Greek text where the King James comes from, literally reads, the Word of Christ let in richly in all wisdom. Let in richly in all wisdom. Now, is it, is it wisdom that lets it in? Or is it, is it the letting in of Christ's Word that produces wisdom? Well, I think both are true, right? Christ and His Word. These are very, very fundamental realities to Christian living. This, these are not superficial statements Paul's making here to fill in space in his letter. 
These are not just helpful hints that Paul is throwing out here, suggesting that you implement Christ's words into your life in order to enhance your Christian experience. This is vital to life and living as a Christian. Paul's underscoring for us as he, as he continues to build on in this chapter, in this letter, the vital necessity of Jesus Christ being all things central to the church. And looking back, and just briefly looking back, in chapter 1, he sets forth the preeminence of Christ in verses 15 through 20 in, in ways that are really some of the most Christ exalting texts in our Bible. He created all things, he's before all things, he holds all things together. Just sets Christ on the pedestal and setting forth his deity, his unmistakable Godhood. And then verse 27, he speaks of the riches, of the glory of this mystery, which is what? Christ in you. The hope of glory, Paul calls it. Then in chapter 2, Paul is expressing his desire for these saints to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is what? Christ. In whom, Paul says, are hidden all the treasures. If you want wisdom, treasure, knowledge, understanding. Paul says all of it. All of the wisdom is hidden and all the treasures are hidden in Jesus Christ. Verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2. He call, and he calls the church to walk in Him. Being rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. Colossians 2.6 See to it, he says, that no one or nothing takes you captive, filling your mind with things that are not according to Christ. In verse 8. Now how is that going to practically happen? How's our mind not going to be filled with things that are not according to Christ? Well, the Word of Christ not dwelling in you richly. That's how it's going to happen. Word of Christ, Paul says. That's a unique term for him. He, he only uses that term one other time in the New Testament. In, in uh, Romans 10.17 when he says, So faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? The Word of Christ. Hearing through the Word of Christ. Paul typically uses the phrase Word of God. So, so what's the difference? Why, why Word of God, Paul, and all your other letters, and most of the times you use it, why Word of Christ now? What? Well, I mean, it's essentially it's saying the same thing. However, I believe Paul uses it in Romans 10 because the faith that comes from hearing is the, is the hearing of the Gospel of which... Jesus Christ is central to. And it would seem for the very same reason Paul uses it here in Colossians because as we've been reviewing here in this book, this letter is very Christocentric. Jesus Christ is at the very center of this whole letter. Let's just keep going on from where we left off. Chapter 2, verse 9. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Can't be any clearer there. He's the God-man. And, and now listen how Paul, after he establishes and sets up who Jesus Christ is and all of His deity, listen to how Paul ties you, Christian, into the person and work of Christ. Verse 10, You have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. Yes, this, this greatly exalted Creator of the world who became a man. Yeah, you. Little old you. You've been filled in Him. In verse 11, in Him you were circumcised. You were buried with Him in baptism. You were raised with Him through faith. Verse 12. You were made alive together with Him. Verse 13. And then chapter 3, Paul reiterates again, you've been raised with Christ in verse 1. You've died with Him in verse 3. He is your life, verse 4. And it gets down to verse 11, it says Christ is just, He's all in all. And then we looked at last time, His peace is to rule in our hearts. 
So in light of all that truth, it seems only fitting and natural that the Word of Jesus Christ should dwell in us and do so richly. I mean, if Jesus is all these things that Paul asserts Him to be in the preceding chapters and verses that we looked at, or we just referenced, if He is that for the sake of His people, you and I, then it only stands to reason that His peace should be ruling our hearts and His Word should dwell in us richly. The centrality of Jesus Christ in the center, to the letter of the Colossians, it's unmistakable. He is worthy. He is truly all in all. Je- Jesus Christ is not a side note. He's not a secondary figure. He's not another image you might want to consider throwing among your other figures in your stained glass windows within the church building. He's not just part of the story. He is the story. He's the cornerstone. He's the foundation. He's the builder of the church and the sustainer of the church. He's everything. Remember His words to Peter? Upon this rock I will build my church that was all him in that one statement no my dear catholic friends he's not talking about peter there he's speaking of himself like he did so many times throughout his teaching destroy this temple and in three days i will rise it up i raise it up he was speaking of himself not not the physical temple and they still didn't get it Right? They didn't get it. Even when He was hanging there on the cross, they were mocking Him for such statements. Too blind to see it. Too deaf to hear it. They couldn't understand what was true. That's the natural man. And that's how you end up making Peter a pope. And followed by a whole line of godless reprobates claiming to, to speak ex cathedra in some apostolic authority. You don't have to search very hard, very long, to discover the fallacy of such a claim when you just look at the fruit of the Roman Catholic papacy and what it has produced. That's no foundation I want to be on. And that looks like a completely different foundation than the one Peter was standing on. How do you get there? How do you get from this glorious confession of Peter to Jesus saying, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. How do you go from that to Roman Catholicism as we know it today? Well, the answer really feeds into our text here. Failure to dwell upon the words of Christ. Failure to make your soul rich with the treasures of God's Word and to hold it up like a giant diamond and and looking at the different facets and angles and cuts and lines and the beauty that shines forth and glistens off of it. Failure to see that. That behind those words are this masterful, wise God who's precise in His work and His words and His ways. Failure to immerse yourself into that and dig into it and to discover and really see the glories in it bursting forth in such a way where it's, it's transforming. It's life-transforming power is received. Well, you, you just, it's just like simply reading another humanistic, another document, another human document, another book, another novel. A magazine. It's no different. You come away with very humanistic ideas and very man-centered thoughts. Just blind conclusions. Man-centered, dead, lifeless rituals or formalities. And instead of being compelled and enamored with with the virtuous garments we find in verse 12 of Jesus Christ, instead of being compelled to put those on and walk in them, you end up Deciding, well, you know, let's focus on dressing men up in silly gowns and hats and waving incense and repeating all kinds of heartless rituals and calling that the foundation of Christianity when it's nothing nothing of the sort. It's nothing but a foundation of sand. 
And we could pick any false religion for that matter. What's the primary problem with every false religion? It's got a false foundation. They're all sand but one. There's only one foundation. There's only one way, one truth, one answer, and His name's Jesus Christ. And you've you got to see Him right. You've you got to believe Him right. And you've got, to, you've got to know Him rightly and intimately. And in order to do that, you've got to know what's written in this Word, in this book, in these pages. You need to do more than just some cursory reading and checking off a list. You need, as Paul says here, to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. This whole letter is Paul seeking to ward off and defend the church from false doctrine and false teachers. Knowing the Word of God is absolutely critical to that end. The devil's main aim is always, it's always that, right? It's always attacking the truth of God's Word. Interesting enough, that's the very thing. Truth is the very thing that takes the devil down, right? In his effort to thwart it, truth's what takes him down. I mean, that's the very means that Jesus used, right? In disarming the enemy of his soul out there in, in, in the wilderness, in that temptation. Of all the things that Jesus could have done or said or resorted to, I mean, of all that Colossians tells us of, the, of who he is, all that was at his disposal. <laughs> he determines the best weapon against the enemy, the Word of God. Enemy, Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In that statement alone, Jesus places an incredibly high premium and priority on God's Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you. He also affirms that the Scriptures are none other than the mouth of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, Paul says. To dwell means you know, to make a home for. We go home after the service today. We're going to go home. We're going to dwell in our homes, right? Right? It's to make an, an abiding residence for it. To, to, for it to remain and, and to continue to occupy. And there's so much more we could say here about the significance of God's Word in our lives. I mean, this is not a foreign, foreign theme to God's people. I mean, how often are we commanded and exhorted and reminded and admonished about our relationship with God's Word? And why is that? Because it is so important. Its application and usefulness are far beyond what I could bring in one message. But I just want to list a few of them. Just a few testimonies of the Word of God itself and the impact and the application that it has in the lives of God's people. For starters, it's the very means, it's the very power of God to save our souls, right? But it doesn't stop there. Just like Jesus, it enables us to overcome our enemy. John writes in 1 John 2.14, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Notice the link there. How did you overcome the evil one, young man? Because the Word of God was abiding in them. That's how. Psalm, we all know Psalm 119.11. What is it? Thy word have I hid where? Over there in the shelf. I'll get to it once in a while. I might crack it open. No, thy word have I hid in my heart. To what end? That I might not sin against thee. Oh, the word of God is absolutely critical in the battle against sin. The psalmist says, I hide it in my heart to this end that I can defeat sin, that I won't sin against God, that it will be a, a deterrent, a preventative. Against sinning or against sinning against God. It guides and directs God's people. Psalm 19, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light to my path. The Word of God. By it, God's people are sanctified. Jesus prays there at the end of His life. He's praying to the Father in John 17, 17. Sanctify them through what? Through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, all of it, Timothy, it's profitable. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Use the Word of God, Timothy. Paul writes to the, to the, to the Romans in, in chapter 15 and verse 4. He says, whatever was written in former days, don't, don't be ditching your Old Testament. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction or our learning that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So the Word of God gives God's people hope. Enables them to endure. Uh, the Word of God is, is, is a, has a freeing effect about it, right? Isn't that what we find in John 8.32? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That has application far beyond just being brought out of the kingdom of darkness. Word of God is a means of, of granting liberty in all manner of the Christian life. The dwelling or abiding, how about this? The dwelling or the abiding of God's Word within, within us allows us to prevail in prayer with the living God. Jesus says so. Jesus says, if you just abide in Me, in My words, the Word of Christ, my words abide in you. I open it up. Ask what you will. It will be done for you. That's, a, that's an incredible promise. Lord, help our unbelief. The psalmist in Psalm 1 indicates there's a delight in the meditation of God's Word. And therefore, he, he meditates in it day and night. And... and uh, What's the result of it? Well, he likens it to like a tree planted by rivers of water that, that yields its, its fruit in its season and its leaf doesn't wither. And the Bible says all that he does as a result of that meditation, all that he does, don't miss that link, the result of that meditation day and night, the, the, the impact, the result, is all that he does, he prospers. And that prospering there is spiritual prosperity. Although God can certainly make it physical, make it monetary, right? Psalm 19, Psalm 19, we sing it. We're told that God's Word makes wise the simple. You feel like you're ignorant and too simple. and Well, the best thing you can do is spend your time in this. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart, we're told. It enlightens the eyes. And, and such realities produce taste buds that make the Word of God sweeter than honey. God's Word is a comfort in affliction. Psalm 119, 150. This is my comfort in my affliction, the psalmist says, that your promises give me life. <laughs> I think I've found that to be so. The very words of Jesus is the means of our joy. Isn't that true? He says so. His parting words with His disciples just before He dies. These things. I just told you all these things. My friends. My brothers. I just told you all these things. That my joy might be in you. And that your joy might be full. The Word of Christ. You feel joyless, Christian? Where is God's Word in your life? Jesus says it's been given for your joy. The greatest antidote for de depression is not pills, but the truth. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. Psalm 119, 162. The precepts of the Lord are right. We just quoted that one in Psalm 19, 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. I could keep going, but let me stop with this one. If you turn back just a little to 
to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. You've heard both Tim and I make mention that there's a lot of uh, parallel content between Paul's letter to the Ephesians and his letter to the Colossians. Oh, here's one example of it. I want to read here. Let's start in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 18. Paul says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Very similar statement to what Paul makes here in our text back in Colossians, right? In fact, let's just turn back there. Let's read that again. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In both passages, Paul refers to this, this one another statement of communication. In Ephesians, he sort of condenses, condenses, it, condenses it to speaking to one another. In Colossians, he says, teaching and admonishing one another. But both of them continue in almost identical fashion with the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs unto the Lord. The big difference is how he begins the statement. In Ephesians, it's the Holy Spirit filling. In Colossians, it's the Word of Christ dwelling. Spirit fill, Word dwell. By comparing these verses, can we learn something about how a believer might be filled with the Holy Spirit? And how to live a Spirit-filled life? I think there's an unmistakable connection. The filling of God's Spirit, and not, not just the reading or the intake, but the dwelling upon or the meditation of God's Word. We should ask ourselves in light of this, is my lack of Spirit-filled living directly linked to or due to my lack of meditating on Holy Spirit-inspired Word? I think the answer to that is an obvious yes. Putting that question in a more positive way, am I to conclude that if I spend... If I spend more time meditating or dwelling upon God's Word daily, that such a discipline will yield a greater Spirit-filled and Spirit-empowered life? Again, I think the, obvi the obvious answer to that is yes. And that ought to be more of an encouragement to us, right? An actual feasible way to be filled with the Spirit? Now, I don't know about you, but I find it, that to be an encouraging comparison. I think we can easily lean into a hyper-Calvinistic mindset in the most subtle ways when we simply approach God on the basis of understanding how utterly powerless we are, which is true, without Him, compared or coupled with how completely sovereign God is over all creation, which is also absolutely true, and then assume that our only hope of living a Spirit-filled life completely hinges upon His allowance of us partaking in Himself in such a life. Now don't get me wrong, that last part is true also, but if we concentrate only on that, while dismissing the very means He has given to possess a Spirit-filled life, then our theology has gone awry. Now, I'll just be transparent here. I'm, I've been a guilty party to this. Let me ask you, you ever come, have you ever come to, to, to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 and thought to yourself, oh Lord, what? I mean, it's one thing to command my emotions, but... I, how can you command me to be filled with the Spirit? I mean, am I, can I dictate the workings of the Spirit of God? Well, I never made the connection to Colossians. See, Paul can command such 
Because to command such in Paul's theology is the same as saying, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. The application in the negative, don't expect to be filled with God's Spirit if you're devoid of being filled with God's Word. There's a reason the Bible refers to itself as honey, wheat, milk. And food is a necessary component to living, right? That's no-brainer. Without it, we die. The Lord intends to drive that home to us, though, spiritually by comparing His spiritual Word as food to our physical food. No, we get that imagery in manna too, right? Or Jesus representing Himself as bread to us. I wrote down when, when Clint was here with us last week, he, he made this statement, the Bible is the ordinary means of making progress. I like that. That's very true. And, and brethren, it'll, it'll, it'll never be anything else but that. This side of glory. Making progress in God's Word are, are a must. You, you won't have the one without the other. Sanctify, what was Jesus' word? Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. And then, and then Clint talked about meditation. I, I liked the, the illustrations he gave there. I love the illustration he provided on, the, on that act of meditating. One was a bench in a garden. and You, you remember what the other one was? He, he likened meditation to the grinding of coffee beans. And... Uh, Sure, that caught some of you coffee lovers' attention, maybe. <laughs> Did mine anyway. <laughs> what, what's so appealing about grinding coffee beans? I mean, what? Come on, I mean, I'm going to go to the store, get the bag, it's already done. Why, 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 why go through the work of. Well, if you've ever done it, you know. You, you know, it's a great illustration for biblical meditation. I mean, the whole image of grinding and grinding and grinding that bean and chewing it and breaking it up into little pieces. You know what happens in that process? It releases an incredible aroma. That that pre-ground bag that you wanted to get for convenience, it just, it just can't, it can't provide that. I mean, it might smell good, but it ain't going to be close to that, that, that bean getting chewed up and ground up. It's like the difference between the Lord speaking directly to your soul from His Word, and you reading someone else's devotional thoughts on a passage. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, reading morning and evening uh, can most certainly be a blessing to your soul. I'd never discourage anybody from, from doing so. But nothing can compare to hearing the voice of the shepherd. Right? When you're in His Word, and there's a direct communication of God to your own soul. Nothing, nothing compares to that. And then there's that robust flavor that comes from, from, from the fresh ground cup of coffee. The, the pre-ground just doesn't come close to touching it. In fact, as I'm thinking about it, why? I, I'm realizing what I'm missing in our Keurig now. <laughs> We've kind of gotten into this Keurig thing. And I, I miss the old ground coffee. But it's like the difference between ground coffee and the pre-ground bag. It's like the difference between you know, tasting, drinking in a passage of Scripture. Maybe it's just one verse. You ever open up your Bible, have devotions, and you get one verse? It's happened to me. That's all I needed. One verse. One verse, one phrase that ever was ever so sweet to your taste contrasted with just throwing down one or two or three cups of, of chapters and, and, and barely remembering what they tasted like hours later. Brethren, we, there's such a need for meditation. I feel like it's, I think it was a Puritan that said the lost art of meditation. What blessings are yielded from it? He make, the psalmist says, what's he say? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside the still waters. That's what our shepherd wants. He wants us to lie down and graze for a moment. How, how is it with you? Are you a dweller? 
Are you grazing in the green pastures of the shepherd? Or are you just grabbing something real quick and pew, I'm out of here? If you're not dwelling, why? I mean, we'll be pretty hard pressed. Our generation will be pretty hard pressed in seeking excuses why we don't have time for God's Word. And all of the modern conveniences that we have, things that wash for you and dry for you and write for you and cook for you and you name it. Things that are so much more quickly and efficiently moved from here to there. We, brethren, we have to make time to dwell. You know, we, we, I mean, we prioritize. We do. We prioritize and make time for things we really want to. We do. You do. You, you do on a day what you really want to do with the extra time that you have. Of all the comments, or of all the commands, rather, of Colossians 3 that drive us back to verses four, 1 and 4, you knew I was coming here. This one most definitely does that very thing. Yes, seek those things that are above. Set your mind on those things that are above. Why? Because that's where Christ is. That's where He is. And, and we're in Him. And He's in us. And if He's there, that's, that's where our minds need to be dwelling. Dwelling upon Him. Dwelling upon His Word. And our minds can't be dwelling upon Him and upon His Word if they're dwelling here in the dirt. Earthly mindedness does not mix well with heavenly mindedness. It's like a, it's like a square peg in a round hole. It just ain't going ain't gonna to work. It's like mixing water with oil. It's like uh, drinking a glass of orange juice at, right after you brush your teeth or a cup of coffee for that matter. It doesn't taste too good, does it? This doesn't go down well. It totally changes the one thing, totally changes the taste of the other, making it bitter, hard to swallow. It's not very enjoyable. That's what earthly mindedness does to the Christian. It makes God's Word unpalatable, unappealing, not desirable. It makes meditation a labor, not a delight. And that's never a good thing. That never produces the righteousness of God in the lives of God's people. And that's exactly what the Lord is after in His people, the fruits of righteousness. These demonstrations of verse 12, 13, 14, 15, and even here in verse 16. Look here at the end for which Paul tells us, let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. He, he follows it by saying, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. There you have it. There's a wisdom to be had yielded by meditation. It's God's intention in giving wisdom that it be shared for the benefit of others. The strength or health of a good church is evident by its ability to give for its members to be able to give and receive wisdom. Be a giver and a receiver of sound wisdom from one to the other. And where the peace of Christ rules and the Word of Christ dwells, you can be sure that the wisdom of Christ follows it. And this is the design of Christ and how He builds His church. He being central to, in, into the hearts of God's people, thereby issuing forth wisdom in the forms of teaching and admonishing. Teaching being, being positive instruction, admonishing being negative instruction. And when you have this exchange of word dwelling wisdom transferring back and forth amongst the church, with people being helped and encouraged and lifted up and overcoming sin and pressing through trials and difficulties and this overarching display of love and the faithfulness of God, you know what that produces? It produces worship. It produces singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There is no question that music 
and singing are God-designed gifts for the purpose of worship. And they're not just temporary earthly gifts. These are gifts that will ever be the expression of God's people now and forevermore. Do we not see that in Revelation? We, brethren, were made to worship. We were made to glorify God through music and song. And that's precisely why we take such a thing seriously. And we're commanded numerous times in Scripture to sing unto the Lord. Where's Jenny? Do we, do we sing Psalm 96? Sing unto, the, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless His name. Show forth His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the heathen. His wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. We need to get that one implemented. (laughs) Scriptures speak of bringing the sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Here in the Old Testament, we have the sacrifice of animals. It's all pointing to this. God wants to receive the sacrifices of our praise. That's why we never want to treat our song services in a light manner. We don't want to treat the the sacrifice of praise like Aaron's sons treated the, the sacrifice before God with strange fire. And while there are no shortage of opinions about the subject matter, I mean, one thing's for sure. We're talking about Divine, holy worship. Something that we want to present to God as a well-pleasing aroma. Something that expresses to the Lord something of His his worth and value and glory. Something holy and acceptable and pleasing to Him. Psalms. Psalms. Hymns, spiritual songs. Now, folks like to wrangle, they may wrangle over, you know, how, how do we define spiritual songs? And everybody's got their idea of it and think they're right and what exactly are hymns. And... But listen, there's no doubt here that Paul lists a variety of types of singing. He does. And you can't come away from this passage concluding that singing out of the Psalter is the only means or only acceptable form of corporate worship. You can't. That doesn't fly. Even if we don't understand what the three different types of singing listed here are, Paul does provide three types, right? He does. Like I said, everybody has their ideas of what those are, but the truth of the matter is outside of the Psalms, we just, we just don't know for certainty. And rather than getting all caught up in the specific forms of singing, we would do best to stick with what we do know. What we do know is this. These are all corporate expressions resulting from the peace of God, or the peace of Christ, ruling hearts, and the Word of Christ dwelling in the hearts of God's people. They're all expressions of a unified body exalting the living God through His truth. Content matters. In fact, it's a huge factor. Is the content biblical? Does it proceed from the Word of Christ? A a song can't be considered worship worthy if the lyrics are not Word of Christ based. Another factor when it comes to corporate worship uh, and singing is, is oneness. Unity. In the context here, Paul's emphasizing one body. Unified expressions conducive to corporate worship. Corporate worship is not self-expression. It's, it's corporate expression. And I think that's a key factor when it comes to deciding on what to sing and how to sing it. Is it conducive to unified corporate expression? 
And thankfully, by God's grace, I believe we have that here. And I praise Him for that. And interestingly enough, we, we do have three, I guess what I would call types of songs that we sing. Classical hymns and contemporary songs and scripture songs. And I'm very thankful for that because I find all three of those means expressions of worship that are very fitting and glorifying to God and minister, minister to my soul and I trust to you all. And one of the reasons why I really enjoy scripture singing is the powerful way in which it's, it's a powerful way to, to both memorize and worship God at the same time. We don't have to worry about content there, right? <laughs> that's, that's God's Word. Now, I can't begin to tell you how many Scriptures I have memorized just simply by singing them. I mean, Psalm 96. I don't know when I sang that last. It's embedded. Now, I'm no scientist, but it seems that God's designed us in such a way to where music and song create this platform that stimulates an area of our brains that that promotes memory. There's something about melodies and words that combine in a powerful way to embed themselves in our brains. I I know this firsthand because my my daughter's delight in... uh, (laughs) in, They'll be by me, start humming something or singing a song, and for the for the for the for the purpose of seeing how long it takes for me to be uh, to join them, and, and uh, I, I'm not aware of it the whole time. And before I know it, I'm humming something or singing something, and they're over there in the corner laughing because uh, they were successful. <laughs> but there's also something about music that provokes our emotions, right? Certainly, that's true very clearly seen in the Psalms. And I think really in our own personal experience, right? Isn't that what makes the Psalms, after all, isn't that what makes the Psalms appealing to us? We can identify and enter into the emotions that they invoke. And the amazing thing about song and worship, or song and music, is it's not just isolated to human experience. God Himself sings. We have that amazing scene described for us in Zephaniah 3.15 where we are called upon to sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Then in verse 6.17 we see it said of the Lord, the Lord Himself, He will rejoice over His people with gladness and loud singing. What is that? I I can't wait to see that. God singing over us (laughs) with loud singing. You're not just stomaching it, trying to get through it. Loud singing. Joyful, exalting of the work of His hands. That's just an amazing verse. Well, there's a whole lot more I could say on, on this subject of singing and music, but I'm going to stop at this point. And Lord willing, we're going to pick it back up here uh, next week. So, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we do ask You would help us. Lord, I, I know we could all confess sometimes in song services our minds drift and Oh, we would take more of a biblical approach and, and realize this is an avenue that you greatly delight in in our worship of you and the singing of songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And Lord, we pray that you would meet with us in, in the coming hour and that, and that very thing as we seek to worship you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We pray you'd help us be great, uh, greater dwellers of the truth. Lord, help us yield the fruits of, of meditation. We want to be more like our Savior, Lord. Help us to be more like those sheep that are out there grazing in the pastures of our shepherd. We ask for help in this. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen.